You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. So what the games, physical basketball I was at the game. You were not. You, you watched it on my YouTube. I saw the game. I watched the game. I Well, we're here. I'm Bob Moat. Welcome to X's and Joe's, a podcast dedicated to decoding the winning formula in college basketball. And I'm Mike Remuth, welcoming you to Episode 7, The March to Madness. We didn't see that coming, and some things we did. How things ended up at the end of the regular season, recorded on the evening of March 26, 2024. So, Bob, we finally arrived at the end of this, uh, shall we say, interesting regular season, and we're finally into the sacred yeah. month of March Madness. Um, how have you spent your last uh, two weeks in uh, in celebration? Well, uh, we just got back from the annual golf trip down to Alabama, and uh, in between dodging rain and wind and uh, path-only golf courses, mm-hmm. we also found ourselves watching a lot of basketball and kind of just kind of watch it. That was during the conference tournaments. And so we got back right before the selection show where, you know, we kind of just went through the whole, you know, process and then got the brackets all filled out. And right now I got 12 out of my 16 sweet 16 teams still in. So I feel pretty good. good. All four of my final fours. I'm not going to win the darn thing, but I'm going to be respectable. And that's all I look for is being respectable. Exactly. (laughs) How about you? Just don't embarrass yourself. (laughs) Right. How about you? What were we, what have you been up to? Yeah, uh, just I got back from our, uh, my friends and I, we take our annual reunion trip uh, to somewhere remote to watch the first round of the tournament. It's all my high school friends from Terrell North. And um, this year we went to Scottsdale, Arizona, um, took in a Cubs uh, spring training game and uh, just you know watched all the opening games in the dance. We actually rented a... a essentially a multi-room man cave with big screens everywhere, nice pool patio and uh, you know, the, the game room and pool table. So it was fun. It was like we were, you know, 18 all over again. Though I, I will say that I know sort of the years as we've aged that our conversations have moved from mostly sports and movies to topics like the various lubes and ointments that you know, keep our 40 something bodies, you know, semi-functional. So um, I'm hoping that changes over time, but I suspect that it might actually get worse. No, no, we, uh, my, my crew, you know, the, we, we just complained about the pain, the aches and wondering, you know, gosh, how, do, how, how, what, do we really want to play those last three holes? Yes, we do because we paid for it. You know, at that point, yeah. it's like, it, it's your physical discomfort versus your inherent belief that you you're going to get exactly what you paid for yeah um you know or then you know rolling out of bed after not sleeping out of bed that's your own and thinking man i really like my mattress i really like my pillow yeah. you know airbnb this is a nice place and all but it's just not the same as you know trying to having my my 95 pound dog kick me out of my own bed exactly so yeah. you know it is. It is kind of what it is. Yeah. Um, I, I hope yeah. in the fu- I hope in the future we can bend the trajectory away so that you know we don't all sound like we're in some geriatric doctor's waiting room. So <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah, I hope so too. Well, you know we there there you know and and I think part of it's just how you how you take your your mindset going into these things and you know another area that's been really exciting for I think both of us watching the IU women. Yeah, and watching them move from what you know what was a program that was when we were growing up it was there yeah so but kind of there yeah you didn't notice there. it all the time if you're you know, even if you were around the assembly hall during games it's didn't always <laughs> can always tell that something was going on yeah there. i mean there were parents there and i think a couple of little old ladies from bloomington a few students but for the most part it was it and then you compare that to what terry morin and those and, and that and the women's team have brought to IU Bloomington in the last few years, definitely the last five years, I would say definitely where the program just has a lot of juice running through it a lot. And, and, you know, the way the, the, the way that women's team plays, they shoot the ball incredibly well. They share the ball amazingly well and they're lovable, likable kids. That's the yeah. other thing is that it's just, 
you can just tell that there's a that and, and that there's a true camaraderie and a true team that's being built and a culture that's there that that's really cool to see, yeah. and just nice to watch them on a national stage, being yeah. successful year yeah. in year out. Yeah, K- kids that can uh, that are that can run modern offense and are good people are definitely uh, going to get a lot of fans within the uh, the IU network. So that's that's very true. So. So as we kind of speak of that, you know, uh, I know that you know when we peruse home field, it's really cool when we click on the Indiana um, school team shirt, you know, team team gear and apparel area, and we have some definitive choices, you know, not yeah, just for football, stuff. soccer, you know, uh, basketball, definitely men's basketball, but now you know there's some really good choices for women's gear as well, you know, mm-hmm. to kind of show definitive support for the women's everything from the Terry Moore and if you're juiceless, you're useless shirt. Yeah, like to uh, Mackenzie Holmes um, NIL piece, mm-hmm. um, a throwback to the eighty, uh, the eighty. I think it was the eighty three team that won the first won women's the Big, Big Ten. Ten. Yeah, huge. You know, so that's another huge, um, just uh, way that home field kind of just hits you in between the running lights and things that you actually, you know, that, that you're actually looking for that may not be available through the more traditional going. You know, like you're not going to find that at Walmart. I'll put it that way. Exactly. Yeah. And also, they've got hats uh, that we've been looking at, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was I was actually per- perusing the uh, the website, and uh, you know we've been talking about shirts and jackets lately. But uh, I, I want to highlight some of the great hat options that uh, you can find on the site. Um, I found some interesting little gems in there. Um, Slippery Rock University. Um, do you know where that's located? I don't. I actually have never, you know, until I, you know, I, I think this is the first time I actually heard of Slippery Rock. Yeah. Well, it's actually here in Pennsylvania. So it's a mm. small liberal arts college out in, in PA. So I know a few um, SRU grads and they don't often have much access to good college gear. So I know that basically I know why I'll be getting them for Christmas this year and where I'll be getting it from. And I also found uh, Montana University, the Grizzlies. They had a really cool um, slobbering grizzly bear dad hat that I found on the site. Um, I think you know this. We've talked about my uh, being a bit of a closeted um, Big Sky Conference fan. And I do plan to make a trip out there someday to hit all those weird, funky little uh, indoor football stadiums that they have out there. So when I do, I will be sure to be wearing my home field gear, uh, you know, when I make that trip. So, yes, uh, I knew that you were a big, big sky guy. And, you know, it's, again, great conversation pieces. You're kind of going into those towns to well, where'd you get that? Yeah. And you can say, well, we got it at Home Field Apparel, www.homefieldapparel.com, and where – where 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 you can find high quality uh, material materials with incredible design and logos and a great just a just a great piece of apparel and we appreciate their support for us and all the back home network exactly should we get to it bob shall we discuss the block charge rule for segment one i i think that it's one of those things that we need to really get into a little bit and just kind of expand to our to the people listening or watching just how something subtle um, can make a major difference or potentially make a major difference in just how the game is played. Um, for those of you who don't know about the the change in the block charge rule, um, in the past it was basically if a defender gets to position before the offensive player gets to that specific position, then it could be called would usually be called an offensive foul. Yeah. And so it was always one of the most contentious and controversial calls in really a basketball at all levels. Um, did the defender, did the defender get to the spot or did they go in? Were they sliding into position as the offensive player was going in? Yeah. And it really encouraged, it encouraged a great deal of contact the way the rule changed from, and I'm maybe explaining this poorly. So Mike jump in if I, if, yeah. you, if I've got it, but yeah, you that did. plant foot, the plant the, foot has to be down, down. Yeah. But when the plant foot's down and you're not in position, then the offensive player has the ability to, to get to that spot. So basically you have to give that offensive player freedom of movement. Yeah. Yeah. And, essentially essentially yeah. the, the rule is benefiting the, the offensive player um, compared to let's say before the rule change. So when we start thinking about help schemes and every, every coach has how they want to defend ball screens, you know, Jordan Sperber does a great thing on that with a spectrum of 
ball screen coverages. Yeah. Everything from dropping to blitzing or, as Dean Smith would call it, more of a jump where you're kind of either jumping or you're trapping it. Mm-hmm. Um, when we talk about help schemes, a lot of times, you know, when the ball goes to one side, that's the strong side. And then you have weak side defenders. And like at my level, we teach the kids, you know, fifth, sixth graders go to the tape or go to the nail extended. So the middle of the free throw line, yeah. we kind of want them there. And that really kind of dissuades drives. It kind of dissuades, you know, interior passes. It, it, it forces the ball to go East, West versus North, South. Yeah. Well, if, as the game is evolving, you really don't want to be there necessarily because first off, you have shooters on the corners, you have shooters on the wings, yeah, it's spread but, but there's also the thing of now your object may no longer be to stop the ball necessarily in mm-hmm. the lane. Your job, I think is more and more to funnel the ball. So you're watching yeah. these help schemes moving from more the middle of the lane or that nail over more to the elbow extended on the lane line. And you're kind of seeing maybe one foot on that line, one foot in the lane, kind of watching, watching for cuts. And what that's doing is in many respects, and I think part of this, we saw the change very rapidly in college teams where they're like, okay, we're going to stop trying to stop the ball. Traditional teams like Purdue, Wisconsin, Virginia as pack line. A lot of these programs that would just, okay, we're going to go in and we, we want you to go take the charge are now more or less saying, okay, can we funnel the ball away or kind of kind of get it where momentum is moving away from the rim even though they may get a step on us here they may get to the lane but we want to maybe taking a shot that's falling away that's challenged yeah versus trying to just get in front of them and and create a collision yeah and that i think is creating an environment where programs and teams are doing are, are actually kind of it's cleaning the game up in many respects it's also i think helping uh, teams be able to deal with as the ball gets to the lane and you get what you call a level three. And we'll talk about that more in a minute where you see those kickouts from the lane. It really, I think helps teams um, cover that better. Yeah. And you're be- and now you, what you're seeing, you're seeing offensive offenses uh, kind of moving in another direction where they're okay. If you're going to be here, then I, that creates middle cuts for us down the middle of the lane. So you may see a two man game going on on the strong side and instead of a guy staying up top or, you know, post ceiling, you may just see the guy make a real quick cut in there, cutting off the help and getting a lob pass or getting a pocket bounce right. pass in for the layup. Yeah. Um, but it's very interesting to me just what we don't really see coming in these situations is just how quick teams adjust to a very might. It's, it's, it's a subtle rule change, but you're yeah. also undoing some work that's been done since these kids were six, seven, eight years old first learning of the game on how to play help side defense. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, um, like what you said, I I've said over the last few years that defenses don't so much stop the ball anymore as much as they heard the ball. They're, they're trying to essentially create uh, no go zones in terms of, uh, you know, ball movement. When you, when you look at like synergy and, and, and shot quality and some of these other uh, sites that track, um, where shots are taken from and the efficiency that's assumed from them, like, you know, how often and what rate are they actually hit? What are the best shots to take based upon, you know, the trends in uh, most of college with college basketball players today? A lot of that herding is trying to herd players from the high percentage areas to the low percentage areas. So a lot mm-hmm. of defense isn't, they're not trying to prevent shots from going up. They're just saying, okay, we know that this area is where you can actually make shots. We're going to stop you from going there. But this area over here, you're about 10 to 15% lower um, in terms of your chances of making it. Yeah, we're going to push you over to that area. And essentially that's, you know, um, it, it, it's like you said, it's sort of changing the game from what we sort of understood as far as stopping the ball, like get, get in front of the ball and stop it from moving. Now it's like with ice, you know, with uh, like icing screens and things like that, it's basically just, okay, we're creating a wall so that you have to basically move over to here versus going over there. And, and yeah, it's, uh, it, it is interesting that I was just looking the other day as far as like the impact of this rule change. I mean, and you see it's, it's one of those, maybe small inflection point changes in terms of like um, rules that we've seen before. Like you think, but the crackdown on the clutch and grab in the, in the NBA, in the nineties, there's sometimes these 50, 50 split between a, 
a rule change that either benefits the offense or defense. This is clearly one that you know seems to be benefiting the offense. Uh, there was a stat I saw just a few weeks ago that said that scoring was up from last year. It was at like 71.76 points per game. It's up to 73.89. So about a little over a two-point increase in in overall scoring, which seems small, but That's actually when you think about it in terms of the aggregate, it's actually pretty significant. So um, it, it, it's kind of, it, it's kind of a huge thing. You're talking about another full field goal a game, another two points, two points per game on average. And that accounts for differentials in systems, differentials, you know, your high scoring, high tempo teams versus your teams that are trying to hold things lower. Um, I just wanted to add, you know, and, and I think part of this is, you know, we talk a lot about driving in particular. Um, and I think a lot of it's just how fast, you know, the game has to move faster when you when you throw a shot clock in. Um, we see this in the college level. We definitely see it in the NBA. We're going to see it at high school, I think, in the in the not so distant future, just because I think that there's that desire, that move to. It, it kind of it, it it kind of just puts the game in a position where you you you're not going to be able to play tempo control like you used to. Exactly. Um, that being said, um, we are now at a point where I think that there's been some there's been some conversations, some things that you know again things you don't really see coming, and the conversation has been for the last X amount of years, I would say, since I've been coaching. Had a kid that once walked in with an article who and said. Look at what we're doing with post players. Now, this was this kid's in his 30s now, and the, okay. watching the de- decline in post play. And what has been, been interesting in the last 10, I was kind of thinking about this. And again, thinking about IU in particular, but also thinking about Purdue, thinking about some of these teams that are that are using the post a great deal. Mm-hmm. What's actually happening? And so I kind of we dug into that a little bit and kind of looked at this from a different uh, a different perspective. You know, how can you kind of chart this out? Is post play really declining? So Synergy does a wonderful job of kind of tracking, not just, you know, they usually do a good job of kind of tracking scoring plays, but also three specific areas where you not only have where they get a shot or a turnover, but also where you get um, a pass out of it. So you'll notice here that the red line is pick and roll, which is, you know, um, the, the yellow line is post play. And the blue line is going to be ISO. And the best way to describe, you know, the difference between ISO and a spot up is it's where you basically clear out the floor for a player and the player doesn't really give the basketball up. Yeah. Whereas a spot up is where, you know, you try to make an initial move or initial attack and then you kick it out to somebody. So there's a little difference between a spot up and an ISO. Yeah. But ISO, think of pick and roll without a picker is the best way, but without a guy screening it. So, um, You'll notice here at the highest team, you know, the team that, that that led the country in these types of plays, you'll notice that since 2015, and especially after the 30-second shot clock kind of came in around 2016, 2017, you've seen kind of a, a, an increase of 10 percentage points on the high end. You'll notice that post-play has kind of stayed, again, relatively stable. A lot of those years, you'll see that type team, that team is Purdue. 2022 is a little bit of a difference because IU fans will remember that team as being Wyoming. Yeah. And they had a point guard, Maldonado, Maldonado who yeah. that kid was about six seven, and he'd bring the ball to the floor, throw it, throw it to a side, and then get himself down in the post to try to, to take advantage. Inverted, of, yeah, to an inverted yeah, post. Yeah. Exactly. Plus, they had Graham Ike, who's now playing for uh, uh, Gonzaga. Gonzaga. Yeah. So they were, and you know that was the year, and that's year IU again, first year that Woodson had both, Ray, you know, and he had Race Thompson and Trace and, and Trace Jackson Davis, Michael Durr. He had some big dudes there that could that, that could definitely handle that. Yeah. But where you're noticing that that top play is ISO ball going down, where from 22% at the top to around that 15% margin. And so yeah. you're talking at two or three possessions a game, more going to the pick and roll than the ISO on the top. And if you go to kind of the median, it becomes even more, less, less jumpy. Like um, this is the high end. This is the, the the leaders in the country, but there's also the median. And I think that's the next slide I have. Yeah. Um, which is you'll see a very steady climb in pick and roll, post staying kind of stable, and then that ISO ball, you know, with that. And like a you know, if you watch the end of that Houston game when Houston had half their team fouled out, they started running a lot of ISO plays. Yeah. Because they really didn't have much else to run. Um. 
but it's I think a lot of this kind of goes down to it's probably I think better for offenses in this current era to play three on basically three on two or two on three, yeah. you know, forcing three defenders to guard two, which then gives you a three on two advantage on the weak side versus ISO, which kind of is a, you're hoping to beat one man and then you're hoping for help to kind of come over and stop you, Yeah, which that becomes a little harder to kind of work through just because now you're playing basically four on three and your spacing just isn't all that great. Exactly. And it's easier for two guys to cover an area. Yeah. Um, Plus, it's slower. I mean, I think ISO is a lot slower, and I just like I think post plays a lot slower. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, defenses think, have time; they have more time to react. Yeah. No, exactly. And I, I, I think what you said is probably one of the main reasons you see such a spike in pick and roll these days is that it's just easier to initiate. I mean, when you, what do you see typically? Like at least eighty percent of the time, when either the shot clock is going down, or the point guard's mm-hmm. like three five feet from the basket. Or they're, you know, at the end of the half uh, or the end of game situations. They'll typically point down to somewhere in the post. The big guy kind of lumbers out to the top of the three-point line and they start, you know, a, a, a pick and roll action. And it's just the easiest thing there is in basketball to actually create some kind of um, defensive movement. I mean, it's very good at uh, creating basic rim pressure and getting defenses into scramble mode, which, frankly, it's kind of the heart of modern offense anymore. Get teams scrambling, switching, um, you know, basically like I compared it to being on a hockey power play, just always constantly having them uh, moving and you shifting the ball to the open person and also getting the chance to possibly, you know, get to the basket and uh, usually oftentimes draw fouls. So it's, and you're right, it, it also keeps the ball in the hands of the point guard, which you really like to have in a lot of offensive sets is that when the defense forces the ball out, out of the point guard's hands, that's kind of a win, unless it's actually going to a position where they're immediately going to score, whether it's like a lob to a big that's dunking or to a wide open three point shooter or something like that. Pick and roll action is great because it's, it just keeps the ball in the point guard's hands the longest compared to many other actions where you're just passing off to like a, a two guard or a big, and they're obviously not quite as adept at passing typically as the point guard is. So yeah, and it's, and it's also, I, I, I guess, not only is it easier to initiate, it's also just a little bit quicker. I mean, you think like, you know, running floppy action and a lot of the other things, some of those things like take, you know, four or five seconds even to get going. Like you have to run like one guy around like multiple screeners. He catches the ball and then that's kind of where things start. Either takes the shot and he has to move over. It just is, it involves oftentimes more people to just get those things, um, you know, into the proper spot. Whereas the pick and roll action, you can have just basically the big in one spot point guards like heading a direction and have like three or four options all around them. So, and you can run it multiple times. I mean, you, I watched a a play, I think, during actually the Big Sky um, Conference uh, tournament where they ran three separate pick-and-roll actions in one 30-second um, shot clock sequence. Like, they literally went down, quickly set one on, like, a mini break, got stymied, ran again with, like, you know, like, 17 seconds, got stymied again, and with, like, six seconds left, ran it one more time and got the foul line. So... So yeah, I, I think you're right. It, it's it, it is essentially easiest. It really conforms most with like what you see in the modern game. Uh, it's quick, and uh, yeah, just uh, it doesn't really limit your options. And there's just all sorts of things you can do oh. from that. And it's uh, and I think you're going to see unless things really do change and kind of like you know torque in another way, uh, it's probably going to see more of it as time goes by. Well, you have kind of it's 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 a, it's twin brother or sister uh, dribble handoff or handoff option like yeah, big yeah, to, yeah, big yeah, to guard yeah. handoff. It's the same idea of two man game, but like you know you were mentioning end of end of the sequence. You're watching transition schemes now. When you watch most teams run transition, that big is sitting at the baseline basically, you're blocking out trying to go for the rebound. You may see the big occasionally being up at the top or something, but for the most part, the big man there's at least one that's trailing the play and you immediately in transition. Now you see teams who's getting right into a drag screen or getting right into a quick handoff type situation to try to create two man game because in transition, the defense is already moving. When you talk about actions, a lot of times you're 
you're trying to get a defense on the weak side, particularly moving in a certain direction, or trying to just get the defense to kind of start, you know, not get in a fixed location. Yeah. You want that defense kind of changing. Um, and that's where, again, that level one, level two, level three in the ball screen is so important um, because level one is when the ball handler basically takes it themselves. Level two is you're hitting a roller. And whether that's the person who initiates a handoff or in the case of a pick and roll, they're setting the screen, that's that's hitting that 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 screener. Yeah. Level three is hitting anybody else. So it could be a cutter on the baseline. It could be someone sitting at the wing. In the corner. You yeah. know, when their man kind of comes over. Um, and increasingly, you know, you're talking not just about, okay, winning the drive off of the off the screen and roll, but now when you kick it out on that level three to a guy on the wing. They have a choice, and the choice basically is he has two quick attack choices. Attack choice one is make a shot, you know, take the shot immediately, or two, drive it, or even make a quick pass into somebody inside. So it's a matter of attacking and winning that closeout. Exactly. And the and I saw a video. Can't remember the guy. I'll, if I find it, we'll put it out there on one of the on, on either the Discord Substack or what have you. But talking about just the gaps, but also you got to win closeouts. If you win closeouts, you're going to win basketball games. And does it kind of take away from the magic of flex offense? Well, let me assure you, running flex offense over and over again gets really boring after a while. Yeah. And there's a reason why teams aren't doing it anymore. I mean, you may get a flex play here, but it, you know, some some sort of set that, that uses it. But for the most part, you know, you're looking at how do I get the ball to my guys in scoring areas, not by designing a set, but by creating a, the situation for them to score. Exactly. So. And that's, you know, as again, we, and, 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 and that comes down to players. And I think one thing we were talking about, you know, kind of subtle changes, talking about the transfer portal in particular, you know, two guys we were looking at a year ago when we thought, when we were talking about, man, these are guys, interesting guys in the portal, guys leveling up from a lower conference to an upper conference and yeah. Dalton connect and Nick Timberlake. Yeah. Yeah. No, those, those were two, I think, about well, about twelve months ago, uh, IU fans were talking about both of those guys, and, and yeah, I guess it's good that you know, as IU fans, we can talk about connect without you know some tears of longing as we had uh, you know last year. Or slamming my head into my desk. <laughs> yeah, especially <laughs> like, as, yeah, especially when we found out he was wasn't uh, going for an official visit. So um, yeah, and, and we'll have a pod probably in the coming weeks, uh, just as a preview that. Um, uh, we'll have a pod that will uh, go into the portal in depth. We'll be discussing not only the current portal, but just trends we're seeing uh, year over year in terms of the type of players, you know, the kind of productivity we're seeing, you know, the sourcing of, of players you know, going up and down. And uh, just, yeah, just an overall sort of synopsis of what uh, what we're noticing in the uh, the early infancy stages of, uh, of the portal. But yeah, um, Timberlake and Connect. Um, yeah, the, those are two interesting guys because I remember when we were talking about both of them, um, we liked, I think, both of those guys we did. from what I remember. We did. Yeah. Uh, but we, we knew they were kind of different in that uh, Connect obviously had more athleticism and length, and Timberlake looked like he was going to be a, just a better shooter overall. So it was a little bit of like a trade off between, between either. Well, what I, what, Interesting, obviously, what's happened is that Connect has become uh, a National Player of the Year candidate, and Timberlake has basically become a bit of a uh, maybe a bit of a disappointment compared to maybe what uh, Bill Self in Kansas was expecting when they brought him in. And what they really were needing. I mean, it was one of those things where I think they brought him in there specifically to be a guy that could help stretch the floor, mm-hmm. increase their three point shooting uh, efficiency and effectiveness. It just didn't happen. And I mean, when you look at our, you know, when you look at like connect what he turned into BPM, offensive rating, shooting, he not only maintained what he did, but he actually got better in some areas going yeah. from going, jumping, really starting off as a, as a Juco to two years. Where was he from again? Do you remember? Was a Northeast junior college, I believe Northeast junior college. And then the last couple of years before this one, he was, where was he? I mean, I can't remember off that my was head. Was it? It was in the big. Well, he was in the big sky. He was yeah. at Northern Colorado. Northern Colorado. Thank you, because yeah. I almost yeah, I knew it was in Colorado. Yeah. I didn't want to say Colorado State. Yeah. But his BPM jumps to elite numbers at over ten. Yeah. Connect. You know, as and he's kind of this. He's the key piece for why it, why Tennessee is a two seed again. 
that's why. Yeah. Uh, as a big part of that. And going into that system where he just kind of adds a dimension to the a Tennessee offense that oftentimes has struggled. Yeah. Um, Timberlake going from Towson, uh, Towson, I think. You know, he, he Towson was, State. He, yeah. Towson State. Thank you. He, his, you know, again, he, we see going from over 30, probably, you know, 35% type three point shooter to under 30. Yeah. And his BPM reverts back to not what he did his fourth year, but more like his third year where he looks like more like an average player. Yeah. And that's just kind of when we start talking about the portal, what we didn't really, you know, what we, what we kind of see coming here is that it's kind of like when we're talking about sweet spot recruits on a one year rental. Or a five star on a one year rental is probably more appropriate. When you look at that one or two year guy, you know those first couple of years can be really rough and very inconsistent to say the least. Sure. And you don't always know what you're going to get in that situation. Yeah. And what may separate the kind of the men from the boys or the the women from the girls here is that first, you know, guys like Connect or like Tristan Newton for UConn, who are at that level of elite level play yeah. that can fill in those blanks or like Kalel, where was for Indiana this year, kind of going into, you know, really coming under the portal that way. Yeah. Um, Lance Jones for Purdue, even though it was on elite numbers, you know, but you get, that's probably more, your more than it is where, solid. You, yeah. where you're taking a kid. He may, you know, we see a jump in productivity because he's got better pieces around him. And now he adds a needed piece to a system that's already working close to optimally. Exactly. So. Yeah, and I think what what's interesting for me from the you know sort of the recruiting side is the comparison to high school and maybe why explains uh, where you have such a high degree of variance in the portal compared to like at least in terms of expectations is that. In high school, you have camps where all the players are playing against each other um, at that level. That are kids are basically going into power five. You'll have many weekends where you'll have multiple games going on where these kids are just constantly getting exposure against each other, and coaches can see, okay, this kid uh, is able to handle driving on, let's say, uh, power five level power forwards at his, at his class level, or this kid can't quite rebound against you know the centers and power forwards at the power five level so there's this exposure and there's kind of understanding okay like uh, coaches can set up their hierarchy um targets for you know what who they want to chase based upon their performance against these other kids you don't really have that with uh with a lot of these portal kids because the kids are all of varying ages varying levels of experience, mm-hmm. all coming into college, into let's say power five basketball at the same time. And you are not going to have much game film of them playing against power five level competition. If they're making one of those jumps, like you said, I think Timberlake played against Clemson, Pittsburgh, Ohio state and wake, I think, and mm-hmm. connect played Houston, Baylor, and Colorado. So those are two players that you're offering scholarships that you only have maybe 60 to 80 minutes of actual game film of them playing. Whereas high school kids, you may have that much film on kids in a single day at an AU event. So coaches have to really make some estimations and some guesstimations on like, okay, whose kid, which of these kids game is actually going to translate based upon, you know, their athleticism, their skill sets um, versus, you know, having just as much uh, just sometimes almost libraries uh, full of videotape for kids that are coming out of high school. So I think that's really like something that's going to be interesting to track. And like I said, on a pod uh, coming down the pike, we'll get into this a little bit more. And, and again, as we kind of go, as we look at this further, again, part of this is, you know, will these kids gel and connect together? I know this is something USA basketball dealt with, and you know, going from the college game, you know, when they, when the college players lost in 88 and they went to the NBA guys and they dominated for two Olympics, got a near scare against Lithuania in 2000 and then won the bronze in 04. And they said, we got to find guys that can play together versus guys that the marketing department thinks would be good to put on a t-shirt. Yeah. And that is kind of the same thing here that you don't know really what you've got. And especially in these short 
almost Vegas wedding on a on a honey on a on a quick lark sorts of weddings between coaches and portal players. Yeah. You don't always know what you're getting until they get to campus. And will these guys gel with the five guys, seven, eight guys that we have here? Yeah. Or if you're, you know, sometimes you're Utah State, and guess what? Hey, you're 13 guys and the new coach. Yeah. They hit it off, and you know they're a love story for the ages. But you know we'll get to that a little bit more in our next segment as we start talking about teams in particular, and some teams that we thought did did some things that we really weren't expecting on a good way, and some on a bad way, and a, kind of a big one with with an entire class of coaches. So we'll get right back to that here after the break. And welcome back to X's and Joes. I'm Mike Weymouth, joined by Coach Bob Motes. Bob, let's talk about teams that surprised us on the high side and the low side. But I think we're, I guess we're obliged out of familial and hometown loyalty to uh, start with the Sycamores of Indiana State. March on. Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, from my my standpoint, I know they're, this is uh, Tuesday night, so I believe they're just about to tip off uh, against In Cincinnati. about one minute. Yes, exactly. And I know I saw <laughs> Coach Tonsoni was uh, in Terre Haute heading to, uh, he was at the terminal, and then I saw he was going to the Bayou later, so some very familiar haunts with uh, with me. Um, yeah, the uh, so ISU, uh, I, I'll get my rant out of the way. I thought it was a travesty that they were passed up by the committee for Virginia and that, mm-hmm. you know, that Valium on hardwood style of play that, uh, that they're known for. Um, yeah, I, I felt like I needed those eye clamps that they used on Malcolm McDowell in a clockwork orange, just to force myself to, <laughs> to stay awake for, you know, the, that first four, uh, game that they played uh, last week. But, um, yeah, I mean, one thing I really like about ISU, you know, our last pod that we did with Sam, you know, Sam's story, I mentioned Baylor, the Baylor's 2021 team as my ideal sense of modern offense. ISU is very much in that same sort of category. You know, they have multiple shooters and attackers. They're spread out all over the, the half court, each a threat to score um, from multiple points uh, in the half court. I mean, I th- believe ISU is one of the few teams in the country that all five starters average 10 points a game. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I know that's one of those things that I'm always talking about is balance. Mm-hmm. Uh, teams that are disbalanced offensively, defensively, and we'll talk about one team in segment three that has that problem. Um, but teams that uh, do have just more let's say less variance between, you know, the t- their first score and their fifth score are just much more difficult to, uh, to cover. And I'm sure as you, as a, a coach can attest to that. It, it, it's interesting because yeah, it's it, the, the more, the, the more threats you have, the more you have to account for in a scouting report defensively. And the more you have to play guys, honestly, which creates like a guy like Robbie Avila, who he drives the ball. Well, he shoots the ball. Well, he passes the ball extremely well for a big, so what he doesn't do, and let's say, you know, he's not going to go down to the block and, you know, drop step you to death. He's going to force you to, and especially mid-major bigs, he's going to force them to get out there on him and guard him. And then he's going to create help dilemmas just by being at the top and maybe getting by a guy. And it's not, it's not about getting by everybody. It's about getting by a particular positional player mm-hmm. that can really kind of make waves and make things difficult. Yeah. One thing Scherz, uh, Coach Scherz has done there is it was amazing to me was, you know, he kind of walked into how do I change what I'm doing based on what I'm seeing and what I have available. And, it's a, you know, I do like guys that kind of work their way up the coaching cycles. I think he yeah, was at a too. D2 school for a long time and yeah. did very well there. Indiana State took kind of a gamble on him, I think, in their estimation. And much like, you know... Um, you know, like when Terry Hepner went in football from DePaul, or it was a, you know, goes to it's Miami a, of Ohio. Yeah. Was Wal- he was at one of those. He was at he some was small, small schools. Yeah. Goes to Miami of Ohio and really kills it there. Um, very similar story. And I, I mean, I'm going to be glad to see. I, I think he's kind of in that coaching carousel right now conversation. Yeah. It's unfortunate for Indiana State, but fortunate for him and his family that you know he gets a chance to maybe up a level and up some pay. Yeah. But it it's impressive to watch Indiana State and watching yeah. how they move the ball, how they attack. 
defensively what they're doing to kind of just force tempo. They're one of the fastest teams in the country, one of the best shooting teams in the country. Yeah. And again, they should have been playing there. Yeah. And I think it's true of a lot of mid majors. And I'm just going to throw. I, mean, I don't really. We're not going to talk about all of them, but you know, you go through the Kempom top ninety that that top quartile, and you see several like the Mountain West, <laughs> a bunch of those teams. I mean, yeah. they got six bids. James Madison, Grand Canyon, all these, you know, some Ivies, uh, Princeton and Yale, both in those areas. Mm-hmm. Um, it shows that the portal didn't kill the mid-major yet. Yeah. And I don't know if it's going to because there's going to be so much fluctuation in and out yeah. that I think you're going to see, like, there are going to be players that, okay, you're a top 75 kid. And now you want, you know, like a Christian Landers is a great example that's going to Western Kentucky. Yeah. And Brandon Newman. You know, okay, I'm going to go to this school and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to do more things. I'm going to showcase more of my game. I'm going to have more of a role, and you know, you can kind of see those guys and those teams playing against Power Five teams a little more effectively. Yeah. As a result. Yeah, and you kind of notice that. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a little bit of a zero sum game uh, with players just moving in and out, and I and and you're right. I think people kind of assume that well. Teams at this level are going to benefit, and the teams below them are always going to be the the net. Um, so it's always going to be to their detriment uh, in that exchange. The problem is that you just have players moving all over the place. You have mm-hmm. players moving up, you have moving down, moving sideways. I think what it's what's most likely to produce is just teams at multiple levels will be split into are you um, are you gaining or are you losing uh, mm-hmm. in the process. And there's going to be teams at the Power 5 level that are going to be both on the positive and negative side. There's going to be teams at the very bottom of college basketball that are going to be in that same boat. So I, it's something, again, that we're tracking and we'll probably discuss more at, uh, you know, at, at a later date. But it, I, I think some of the assumptions that people made about uh, maybe the hierarchy of the movement within the portal uh, didn't really come to fruition. And it's a little bit more of a... a, a nuanced reality than I think people assume when it first started. It, it's hard, you know, again, you, you know, it, it's hard to, and this is why, you know, hot takes suck because it's, we, you want to make this big sweeping trend of, well, why like another good example of a hot take is looking at, you know, teams that are moving conferences. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've seen a few this year with, you know, the PAC 10 had an amazing final run in the NCAA tournament. I'm saying that because I don't know. I don't know if the Pac-10 can survive with two teams. Yeah. In fact, I know that it can't. Yeah, the Pac-2. The Pac-2, yeah. and you're seeing, um, but you know, like Houston moved up yeah, as well as did Cincinnati and some others. In from in, oh, um, BYU is another example of this moving into the Big Twelve. Um, this um, uh, and now you see more of them moving into that conference. But I mean, I think one of the big questions for some of those schools moving up into a power conference, would they be able to compete? Because we, when we talk about Houston, we talk about, well, usually they run into a team that's really athletic. They almost had that problem against Texas A&M, one of your favorite teams to watch, Mm. watching them, you know, almost getting beat by them um, as a one seed in a one and a one nine game. But you watch, but Houston really kind of held its own throughout the year in the big 12. It wasn't like, Years ago, when Marquette and Notre Dame jumped over into the Big East, you know, out of you know when they jumped over, yeah. they had a regression, and it was a very significant one for a couple of seasons while they got the right guys into positions. Yeah. Houston, I think Florida Atlantic's true on the American side. I think University of Cincinnati going into the Big Twelve, BYU, another example. These were all teams that I think had really good regular seasons. Uh, tournament may not be what they were looking for, but you you. Again, it's one of those things where you know you can make the hot take. Where you may, we really didn't see that coming from a standpoint of just how successful I think a good number of teams were yeah. as they upgraded against better competition. Of course, yeah. And I think what you oftentimes see is that um, it's almost like soccer, you know, like English soccer with like relegation and mm-hmm. promotion. That you know the team that's sort of at the top of this uh, this group gets you know promoted, but then they kind of fill in the the bottom part of the of the uh, the next you know, the, the next level, let's say. Um, yeah, with teams that make promotions uh, to higher conferences, oftentimes what you'll find is that 
they are very high skilled. Let's say they're like teams that oftentimes like have really good efficiency numbers. They shoot well, you know, they they're mm-hmm. they have like advanced Ken Palm numbers on the offensive side compared to a lot of other teams. Uh, but they they still have maybe athletes that are that are still well aligned to that prior conference. And then they make mm-hmm. the jump. And they still have the same type of shooters and uh, skill guys. But now they're running into teams that are just much more physically dominant and can really get in their face and really just drive a lot of their advantages and numbers down. I think that's why Houston made such a, a successful jump because Houston, even before they made the jump, they're one of the most physically imposing uh, rosters in college basketball. It's like what we talked about uh, in our roster construction episode. Kelvin Sampson recruits basically like a football defensive coordinator. I mean, he goes out against the most physically dominant kids he can get. Not necessarily, you know, just like jumping and things like that. I mean, kids that are just physically built and can muscle their way through a a intense game like the one you saw against Texas A&M, where they're just like really just getting on them defensively, pulling away rebounds, just like ripping rebounds away from these other teams. And so that's, I suspect that's why Houston could make a jump like that, but maybe BYU had a little bit more of a, a challenge, you know, making that uh, transition. So, so yeah, it's 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 interesting to watch those. Like you said, it's uh, the dynamic does not work out exactly the same for those teams that are uh, you know moving on up. Well, and and again, we we you know, and, and you start talking about things that happen that go in a little worse. We start talking about kind of those analytics conversations where. You know, you look at where Indiana State was in offensive and defensive efficiency, or really offensive efficiency, and let's say you put them into, oh, geez, you go from the Valley to yeah, the American. American, yeah. It, it's there. There may be a differentiation because of that athletic difference. I'm not sure because I don't because of the way they play. I mean, I saw yeah, them play against Michigan State and held. Yeah, the, the, they they held their own pretty well. I'd say like ISU could be like yeah. one of those teams that if they. If they were jumping yeah. now with the guys they had, yeah, they could actually probably withstand it a little bit better than some. Than some. But, um, you know, you look at other teams, though, like another team that kind of, it, they, when they jump conferences, I don't think it was a matter, it was more of a lateral move for Missouri. Um, but, you know, they, and it really the one that really was kind of a shocker this year was Arkansas, yeah. I think. Um, because what I didn't see coming was, kind of that collapse. I mean, Missouri definitely collapsed from an off, you know, and what happened was their, their defense did the same, their offense really just fell out. But with, with Arkansas, you just saw a team that just never came together. Yeah. And efficiency numbers went from, they were elite level defense to now they're in the top, barely in the top third yeah. of, 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 of division one programs um, losing games. I mean, early in the year, they played Purdue at Fayetteville. And I think they beat Purdue. Yes, in that, it was an ex- um, that exhibition game. That exhibition game, which it's an exhibition, blah, 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 but still, I mean, those were high level, high energy, high effect, you know, and, and I, I think that that's kind of, a, you know, looking at the, at the, at the, at, at the hot take world, you know, well, portal teams are going to do this. Well, not necessarily. I think what it comes down to is, did they get the connectivity and because of the way Musselman runs defense in particular and how much emphasis he puts on defense, I think it's harder. I think it's running. I think it's harder for teams to run defense than it is to run to, to get them into offensive schemes. Yeah, I agree. That's that's very I, true. I think it used to be you teach defense first because you can at least defend your way out of it. I think now you have so much emphasis on offense at every level of the game yeah. that it's harder for teams to kind of get into that cohesive defensive philosophy. It takes time to get you there, yeah. and you better be flexible because sometimes you don't exactly know how your guys are going to go, especially as they're jumping a level or a freshman coming into play, does it translate? Because a lot of these kids have found themselves for most of their careers in the middle of a zone defense to protect them from fouls. Yeah. So Yeah, with with Arkansas, you're right. I mean, it's like the cohesion part, you know, plays into it also in the sense of just like the role definition, I thought, mm-hmm. is you think about like Khalif Battle at the end of the season was scoring like crazy. It was like, you know, three points a game and at, at some points. In the beginning of the season, he was kind of like a bench player. And so you want, and of course, L. Ellis, you know, coming over from, um, I guess, you know, he came from Louisville. He's another one of those like high utilization guards mm-hmm. that uh, that Musselman brought in. So you just kind of wonder, it's like, okay, you, you have like 
Ellis and you have Battle. And they're both really good players. But you had one player that had the capability to score like three points a game and you kind of had him on the bench. And so you couldn't really figure out, okay, well, how do you integrate him with like, you know, the other players? And you have, and you have a lot of other like high capacity guys on that team. It does raise the question with the portal about how much, what ratio of, let's say, talent influx can you, can you take in versus how much stability you can maintain in your in your offense and defensive schemes by having so much like your know, churn and, and, and takeover. It's like the problems that Kentucky's had of late with um with Kyle Power is just if you just keep churning guys in and out, even if they are very talented, which clearly like a lot of the Arkansas kids are, it's just at some point you need to have some kind of um stability in there. Otherwise it's just a grab bag. You're just gonna have this volatility of you know up and down up and down between team between seasons and even within seasons because you saw several times where Arkansas looked like man I mean I watched a few games where they look like they're just dominant like you know for certain patches of uh, a game and then they just disappear and then to quickly just hit on like Missouri like talking about that because we talked about you know when you talk about players need utilization like some of these players are used to getting a third of the shots and even in the collegiate level getting a quarter to 30 percent of the of the shots are coming out of when they're on the floor a kid like tamar bates gets the minutes and the utilization together and puts up much better numbers than he did at indiana and it you know he and sean east both you know putting up really good numbers now granted the season they i don't think they won in 2024 mm-hmm. and that's part of you know not really sure on this but it's one of those things where even you know you may get good individual performances but are those individual performances gelling and like you're kind of and i think you're exactly right which is you're doing a lot of ego management now and you're doing a lot of expectations management Mm -hmm. and you're having to and this may be an issue like even timberlake was running into which is you're now option four in an offense Mm -hmm. and we're going to expect you to perform when we need you to perform but it's not going to run through you anymore yeah and for the first time in a kid's life sometimes that's happened to them and it may they may be able to handle it like a pro and be okay through it, but it's still going to have some impacts on their game. Exactly, and I think a lot of teams have kind of found that. And it's also I think when you start talking about cohesion and you talk about you know team culture, and you know you and I have had the kind of an interesting conversation over the years about the class of 2017 of coaches. Yeah, and that was Archie Miller, Sean, um, Chris Mack, yeah. and Chris Holtman. Yeah, and. If you had asked either one of us in 2017, would any of them would 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 they all be where they where they were in 2017? I think we both would have said they would have gotten their extension, yeah. and all three are no longer at yeah. the at the school that hired them in yeah. that year. Exactly. So I mean, you you know, you, you know, you know, with Holtman, it's it's kind of a strange situation. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. Like I, I think you we talked about this. I think after the end of the first year. That, it, you know, if you ask me at the end of year one, which of those coaches I thought would have, like, been the mo- the highest probability of, quote, unquote, making it, I probably would have put my money on Holtman at that point, at the end of year one. I mean, recruiting was humming. He had a top 20 finish in year one. And everything just seemed to be kind of rolling in a good direction. You kind of thought, okay, it's going to be a little bit like uh, the whole Fad Mata thing, you know, the the Butler coach going to Ohio State, recru- mm-hmm. you know, killing it, recruiting, and it's just going to be another, you know, t- ten to fifteen years of uh, of good. consistently good Ohio State. Um, and yeah, it's 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 one of those weird cases, and of course. You know, talking about like the chip stack uh, conversation we had in prior, you know, in a prior pod, Holtman had one of those trajectories that looked like it was matching all the historical uh, averages of the coaches that you know did really well. Like he was kind of the same glide path as Jay Wright and Tom Izzo in terms of recruiting and momentum and offensive defensive numbers. It was like all clicking, and then it stopped. And it just kind of slowly, slowly melted away year after year, especially after year one. Um, their their defensive ratings just went into the toilet. Like, I think their Ken Palm rating their first season was 15. And by year five, it was in triple digits. And they that was on the – their offense was generally decent. You know, the, the offensive numbers stayed at least okay. 
Um, but they just got destroyed by attrition. I mean, they mm -hmm. their recruiting never really amounted to much in terms of, let's say, the sweet spots uh, analysis. You know, in terms of having like high level juniors and seniors, you know, who are like you know going up the trend line towards five, you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven BPM, uh, you know, uh, performance. The only guy that they had that really did that was EJ Liddell. He was like mm -hmm. the only elite recruit that stayed around for three years and sort of hit those numbers. Uh, they had, let's see, Sensiball and Branham were one and done. So they're mm -hmm. great players, but they left. Mm -hmm. And they had just a string of costly transfers. Uh, Luther Muhammad, uh, Jane Ledee. I mean, Jane Ledee's like a second team All-American. He's the reason mm -hmm. San Diego State is who they are. Uh, Alonzo Gaffney, DJ Carton, of course, you know, that's the kid that IU really was after. Michi Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, who is now the best player on South Carolina. He's the main reason that, you know, South Carolina had like a, was a 14 or 15 win jump this year from the prior year. So all these really great players that they had, they signed, but they didn't stay. So the recruiting never really actually profited them the way you probably would have expected it to. It, it's hard because, again, with Holtman, you're not really sure, you know, you're not really sure kind of what his underlying philosophies are other than I'm just going to outwork you. Yeah. Um, Ohio state was always one of those teams like in November, December, they were interesting to watch. And then it's almost like they went on a milk carton for about a month. Yeah. And then you woke up and you the, said, the, the fade always happened. Right. You're like, and, and, and especially the, like the last two years, it was more like, it wasn't a fade. It was just like, just a, it was like a total, yeah. you know, yeah. it was one of those things where it's like, you know, Hey, it's at 30,000 feet. And all of a sudden it's gone. Where did yeah. it go? Yeah. Um, but you would see that they would kind of just never really go anywhere. And again, like I said, Chris Holtman's not gonna be outworked by anybody. Yeah. He's going to work. You know, this is a guy that was, he was an assistant coach at Taylor 20 plus years ago, you know, and that's a, a division three school. And, you know, for those of you not from Indiana and in, in Northern Indiana, and he's worked his way up through the coaching, coaching ranks. Be interesting to see what he does at DePaul. Be very yeah. interesting to see, kind because of, that's where he is now. Yeah. Be very interesting to see what the what his assistant or the, that's running the program now at Ohio State is going to do, especially now with Dusty May replacing um, Jawan Howard. Yeah. But I I really can't tell you the identity of Ohio State basketball since he was there. Yeah. And you can just kind of tell the culture was just it was almost too corporate, yeah. almost like you know too suit. Yeah. Well, it almost up. looked too good, and yeah. that sometimes like. You know, you look at some of these guys, it's like, you. I don't think you would ever see Chris Holt with his shirt off at a football game. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> or taking the mic, you know, and just kind of going after, you know, just going yeah, just nuts. going after I mean, Michigan or something like that. Sometimes when you say the right thing, do the right thing, look the right way, it's not always the best fit. Sometimes, yeah. and I think kids especially need authenticity. And I'm not saying that there wasn't that. I'm not saying that, you know, and I'm not, you know, because I think that he is, and again, he's a man of faith. He's a man of many, many wonderful attributes, but I just never got a good right vibe as to are you really, really, really in a position where you're building something other than just w a good team or what, what's, what we would say is a great team? Yeah. Yeah. Every culture needs a little bit of edge to it. And so, just a uh, little. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. All right. And yeah, for, uh, for our last segment, I suppose we'll we'll have to address uh, the elephant in the room, Bob. Right? Um, do we do the, we have to do that? I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> we will address the uh, our favorite team, the Indiana Hoosiers, uh, and we'll do that next when we come back on X's and Joes. So, Mike, when you start thinking about IU, I know, you know, let's start kind of, you know, talking about where they, what a recent experience you had with thinking about the Hoosiers and yeah. watching the game. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, yeah, something I shared with Bob. So, yeah, during the Nebraska game, I was, uh, was multitasking on my iPad and I, I may have been, I wasn't paying attention. So, I, I, I obviously miss hit like the side menu you see on YouTube where I, I had my playlist of, of old history videos and that, you know, that weepy fiddle song, a Shokin farewell from the Ken Burns civil war series start playing over the basketball game. 
And because I had the volume turned on, so it's it's perfect. It was like I, I thought, yeah, could it be any more perfect? Like, could there be a more fitting motif for this IU basketball season than the music from Ken Burns' Civil War? Uh, I was actually thinking. You remember that folksy North Carolina historian Shelby Foot? Shelby Foot. Shelby exactly. Foot. Yeah. Love him. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know he was like the storyteller during the uh, during the series. I was thinking we could just clip parts of him talking about like Gettysburg or Antietam and just play it over top of the game audio in, in description. And you probably <laughs> couldn't tell that it was actually out of place, you know, playing on the basketball game. Cause you know, he always talked about, you know, he, he talked about slaughters and bloodbaths and stubborn generals and uh, new versus old tactics. And I thought, wow, like we could have just texted you know, Jared or Galen said, look, don't even bother with a post game. You know, I, I think just, we've got an idea we, here. God, yeah. yeah. I mean, volley after volley. <laughs> yeah, exactly. War of attrition. <laughs> War of attrition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. Just thinking about it and, and, and getting into the conversation, like, you know, on, on X's and Joe's, obviously we're, we're generally in violent opposition to monocausal explanations. You know, n- not one thing explains all problems or all uh, things are going well with a basketball team. But from your perspective, Bob, let's just try to maybe pick a f- just one each. Um, one. What's one thing that you would say that you thought in your mind that was more pronounced that hurt the IU team in, in 2024? Right. I'm not going to, I'm going to kind of look at the question a little differently because I think we have to kind of set where this program really was. And we go back to you know, the, you know, the last segment with the class of 2017. This to me, wasn't necessarily that Mike Woodson year three was really more Archie Miller year seven because of the strange haul that he had to, that, that, that Scott Dolson and the athletic department and the administration and board Everyone kind of making the decision to part with Archie, uh, I would say definitely a year earlier than anybody thought. Sure. And then hand a team over to Mike Woodson to say, okay, let this team reach its potential, hard reset on recruiting, let's get us back in the game and get us moving. And then when Woodson comes to town within minutes, you get NIL in the transfer portal, (laughs) both right there you know which is perfect stare, and and you and and I think what when you start talking to that we always knew this year would be a regression mm-hmm. you lose was it 80% of your offense basically you lose four out of your five starters second best player in America second best player in America one of the mm-hmm. you know a, a lottery pick guard you know or not lottery I'm sorry first round guard I should have yeah. said lottery he was a first round mm-hmm. guard um, you had Race Thompson, who was definitively close to that eight level BPM type player. Yeah. Miller Cop. Miller Cop, 40% three point shooter. Yeah. Underrated and defender. <laughs> under, very underrated. A great team defender. Yeah. And you're now having to basically rebuild the roster. And then Tamar Bates transfers, Jordan Geronimo transfers. Mm-hmm. Um, you're kind of almost, and you're bringing in at that point two freshmen and Gabe Cups and Jakai Newton. Newton, you know, injury, it, injury. So you had to make some decisions on roster. Now, by some sort of, of, of as Bob Ross would say, a happy little accident, for lack of a better term, Xavier Johnson goes down with an injury early in the season, and then co- is able to come back for a sixth year. Yeah. So we start talking about roster construction and you have to build from some point. And Mike Woodson has a front court, has a back court. He has Malik Renew. He's ready to move into position, mm-hmm. but he immediately starts looking at how do I replace a rip? My, 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 my trace Jackson Davis finds Kalel Ware, And then I need that wing position. And we now, we know now that Mike Woodson loves big wings. We kind of assumed that already. We kind of yeah. figured based on how he was recruiting, that's what he was going for. But then that, that becomes a genesis of your starting lineup. And the hope was that CJ Gunn and Caleb Banks would ascend to above average, at least, you know, as contributors, you were hoping to see Gabe cups, um, in particular, kind of, you know, at least be able to, you know, play 10, 15 minutes a game. You know, you're hoping Xavier Xavier Johnson could play 30. 
But yeah, that roster construction for me, and especially kind of going with that decision initially, we could talk about that, I think, a little bit with the guards. Yes. Uh, where that, I mean, you, you have a good front court with scoring, and yeah. they, they, they can't, you know, but the guard scoring, and scoring in particular, scoring the basketball. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was definitely a challenge. And yeah, I, I would say that's probably the one thing, you know, again, one of many issues we could discuss, but I think one that's more pronounced, at least in my mind, was the guard issue. And yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go through a lot of stats and, you know, indulge me just a little bit. And I'm not using these as like a bashing mechanism against the incumbent guards, because I think all the guards on this team busted their butt this year and were trying their best under difficult circumstances. Um, but, uh, you know, you've heard it from me places that we had guard challenges or, you know, backcourt scoring issues. Uh, what I don't think people realize is how big a problem it was in terms of when you, when you look at deeper into the numbers, just like how much of a drag it was on the overall team's capability. Uh, you know, one thing I do kind of like about this year is like, I don't have to use much of my usual, you know, boring data to point out like what good guard play looks like. You know, you don't, you don't have to take my word for it. Just turn on your TV and watch games from Thursday to Sunday and watch the guards that play for those elite teams. You know, observe their scoring capability, athleticism, ability to penetrate, their quickness, their, their shooting from multiple spots on the floor. You know, watch some of those games where, you know, teams like Houston, UConn, Texas A&M, Arizona, you know, on down the line that you've watched this last week. And I ask yourself objectively, especially when we're talking about like the starters, does our team look like that? You know, can our guards do those things? Not only just like do them, but do that at that speed, at that level, at that consistency. And I think you'll suspe- I suspect you'll find that those differences are not terribly difficult to spot. You don't have to be a, a professional scout to see, you know, those kind of variances. And again, th- this is not a recent problem. I, I've I've talked about, you know, IU's guard issues for a while. I mean, IU has not had a, a box plus minus eight plus guard since 2013. And that is a remarkable stat if you really are someone that kind of tracks this sort of stuff. Most good teams have multiple plus eight guards on their squad in a given year. And it's no coincidence that the last time IU had a plus eight guard on their teams, they had two of them, and it was 2013. And we know exactly what happened that year with, you know, that, that was Holes and Oladipo were both uh, above eight. UConn has two right now, uh, Spencer and Newton. Houston has three and Shed, Cryer, and Sharp. Right. And we can go down the line. All these teams, you'll notice, have multiple guys that are at that level. IU hasn't had one since uh, in over 11 years. And so this is not a this year problem. This is sort of an institutional problem that's been going on. You know, and I've written about this, you know, long enough. I mean, in terms of like, you know, what the source of it is, you know, IU, like Woody has an 8% hit rate on top 80 guards. Uh, He's got a, actually he's got an 0 for 21 streak on top 80 guard offers at the moment, which is obviously not what you want if you're trying to build and change that dynamic of getting like those upper tier guards. Um, Archie's guard recruiting wasn't much better. I mean, his his rate was like 7%. So, I mean, they're basically kind of right around each other. And obviously Archie's guard recruiting should be seen as a cautionary tale, not a, not an instruction manual. And, and also, you know, Obviously, like the sweet spot angle, you know, we we're always talking about trying to take in those 30 through 80 kids. Um, the last 16 guards I was taken in, none of them were in the 30 to 80 range. I mean, the last sweet spot guard I actually had that left was Robert Johnson. So, again, it's not only just like getting those higher level kids, but even getting the kids that we kind of talk about on Exodus and Joe's like, hey, you know, the guys that you typically see from the high school ranks that are going to like hit those upper level performance uh upper level performance you typically see in the NCAA tournament, you'll find more heavily uh, populated in the 30 to 80 range. So like, so all that taken together, like, you know, what's, what's the impact? Um, IU this year, uh, their, their numbers just in terms of what their guards are outputting, you know, like box plus minus offensive and defensive rating, all that kind of stuff. They are, at the level about of a team at a Ken Palm level of about 200. 
which is obviously not great. Um, they're behind, they're behind the likes of Louisville and Georgetown and, you know, George in terms of what their guards are producing, not like what the team is producing, just the guards, just you know, taking all these teams guard cores and just like looking at them individually, like what are they actually contributing to their team? And again, they're about at a 200 level. So when people ask like, well, how could we, how could I, you have this problem when you know, have all these great forwards on their team, but still be, you know, basically well outside the tournament. And it's just a simple math problem. You know, basketball is a cumulative sport. The front court is producing at about the level of a Ken Palm 30 range team, which is great, which, you know, gets you a pretty decent seed in the NCAA tournament. But if your backcourt is at about a 200 level, then once you're sort of averaging that all together in terms of the team's actual output, they're basically it's kind of meeting in the middles from like a, from the front court up here, at 30 and the backcourt down here at 200 is kind of like meeting down at a level of where they are now, which is, I think, Ken Palm 91. So it's generally just a problem that you see of output. It's the inability to just do some basic things that most decent teams with good guards do, like hit threes. I mean, I was at 32% on threes, which obviously everyone kind of talks about a lot. They're 61% from the line this year, which is uh, pretty remarkable in terms of like what you compare even to IU's forwards. I mean, IU's forwards and bigs are actually plus 7% above IU's guards and three throw percentage, which is a very unusual um, circumstance you see on teams. I mean, occasionally you'll see like the bigs outshoot guards on teams, but to see a 7% variance is very strange. Uh, the last place NCAA free throw shooting team in college basketball is Army. They shot 60% from the stripe. IU is just 1% better than them. And, and, yeah, and it's also, you know, just the problem of what Sam and I talked about, which is like dribble penetration and attacking. You can have teams that aren't necessarily great shooting teams, which IU is obviously from the guard position. They're not great. Um, but they're, I use sort of that rare combo of a team that doesn't really dribble penetrate very well and doesn't shoot particularly well at the same time, which is just puts a huge burden on your team's overall capability. Even if you have great bigs, you can't really spread the floor and get, you know, guys open space and give them ability to like not operate in a congested lane the way IU did so much this year. You know, like Texas A&M, they're a horrible three-point shooting team but their guards are some of the best dribble penetrators in the country. So they can make up for just having horrible three-point shooting by the fact that those guys are just constantly getting in the rim, constantly getting fouled. I mean, I think they, they shot 623 throws this year, the guards alone, and IU only shot like 180. So, so I mean, they almost like tripled up what IU was like doing for the line. So it's just all these things, you know, can combine just the shooting, the penetration, the, the overall output relative to the bigs just put IU in just such a, a difficult spot where the bigs night in and night out basically had to do an insane amount of work to try to overcome the guard advantage that they that the opponents carried, um, you know, into most of the games. Well, and and I think systemically, you know, I mean, IU tried and, and it, it's unfair to categorize IU as just being a post team only because they did. Yeah. They made adjustments throughout the season. I mean, they did. They were one of the better, one of the better efficient and utilization cut teams. You know, they got a lot off of cuts. Yeah. Um, they're not a. You know, they don't spot up as much because I think part of it is well, is it a chicken egg conversation that we could have? Because I would say I push back on guards a little bit because the Big Ten has never really been a you know, has not been a guard league mm-hmm. for a long time. Um. Well, that explains the nat- that's, that. also kind of explains the lack of national championships. <laughs> Which we, yeah, we're 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 there. I mean, we're we're at the yeah. beginning of this converse. Yeah, that's, yeah. and I can see. But you know, I'm almost a thing where it's like systemically when you're trying to just put the ball by passing inside, mm-hmm. and you're trying to get the ball to certain players to make a play in a way that's kind of mechanical. And this was a problem. And this has been a problem. I really go back to some of the cream teams and some of this where they were overly mechanical at times. There are some times where cream teams ran some brilliantly beautiful offense. Yeah. And there are some times where it's like, what are we doing? Do we even know what we're running? Mm-hmm. But here it's like, you know, the last decade, you kind of watch that mechanical area of, well, ball goes here, should be going inside. 
and you would just see the ball sticking. Yeah. And, you know, Tony talks a lot, Tony Adranjo talks a lot about, you know, gaps, you know, driving gaps, single Trump, gap, yeah. double back, triple gap. Mm-hmm. When you look at IU, the gap, you know, the ball's moving at times so slowly that the gaps are gone, even yeah. with actions. I mean, an a, a lot of the teams that we're talking about also run actions to create the gaps, to create the mismatches, to get defense in flux. Mm-hmm. You weren't seeing that, and you haven't. And again, that's another problem I think IU has with some of this is that they're not getting the defense moving enough, and and just they can go up against static defenses. And I think that was a problem for most of the season. There were some brilliant possessions, some brilliant times of play where you just saw the ball when the ball moved quickly when they were pushing tempo. Yeah. You could tell that this team could play with just about anybody in the country. But when they got stagnant, there was just nothing really to break them out. And oftentimes we say, well, that's guard play. Now, in all fairness, the guy that they were expecting doing that missed most of the season to injury. Yeah. If you have an Xavier Johnson that's healthy for all 31 games, this this may this team would may have looked a little different. Yeah, it would have mitigated and, some of the problems. I agree, and it, I think I mean, and that's not a knock on Gabe Cups as a freshman, but it's like it's only as freshman. we and we were talking. Well, and and again, I mean, you, but you want to also be in a situation where this was a you know not a problem. Well, I would say it's a problem last year because you had games and a lot of games where you were relying on two players with insanely high utilization rates. And Trace Jackson Davis, I think you could say, delivered every night. Yeah. Jalen Hood Scafino had some games where he really contributed and some games where he didn't contribute nearly as much. Yeah. And that impacted the team in many respects. And then when you put the Jalen Hood Scafino role on Trey Galloway, I, you're asking a lot of that kid who needed to see some some utilization increasing, but not to a level where he's basically the the one guy, the one the one driver on the floor that's going to be looking to score yeah. or looking to make scoring plays. I mean, he had a lot of assists, did a lot of, you know, did a great job delivering the ball. But like I said, I mean, you saw some differences, and especially, uh, and then you add to that the defensive issues as well, which is just that engagement in defense, the connectivity yeah. on defense. Like we were talking about Arkansas, a very similar problem to IU, especially earlier in the season. You could see they were being more flexible. Like you started noticing they moved wear out of drop coverage more and started moving in yeah. more either at the level or even kind of, I wouldn't say blitzing or no middling, but kind of in some sort of, I call it zone coverage up there yeah. where they're trying to keep the ball contained. Mm-hmm. You saw more of that. You kind of saw them move off the nail more. They moved the nail a little bit, and they kind of covered the shooters a little better, yeah. especially in that. And again, and, and again, you had a team that ended the season on a five-game win streak until yeah. the Nebraska game. You, it's a 19-win team that if they had chosen to play in the NIT, could have played in it. All of that aside, though, you know, the other thing that kind of just kind of when you start talking chip stacks, and we talk about this a lot, the 2024 recruiting class, the 2025 recruiting class and kind of the move away from and almost a seemingly quick move away from high school recruiting altogether, at least long-term recruitments. Yeah. It does seem that way. Yeah. It's, and, it's yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Like, you know, usually like when, when we've talked about the recruiting before, it's usually almost always like, you know, whiffs and hits. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting with Woody that, there were so many times it seemed like he had some access to some recruits that were maybe like more sweet spot kids versus, you know, like top 30 kids. And it seemed like, okay, we just kind of de-emphasize those, those sweet spot kids and go after, you know, more of the, the top 30 NBA uh, potential kids. So it, you're right. It's kind of hard to like gauge. Like, I think like someday once, you know, once the Woodson um, era is over, whenever that happens, uh, it'll be interesting to kind of get some more inside skinny on like, okay, well, what, what was the thinking there about like seeming to like pull back, not only in like the 2023 class where we kind of saw, okay, they kind of went after a few guys mm-hmm. like, you know, Kaiser and them and they just kind of stopped. It's like, okay, well, 2024, they're really going to load up. And then they loaded up with one guy <laughs> and then he bolted. And so it's, well, so it's, so you're trying to like, age like okay what is strategy versus circumstance like how much of this is this is happening to you and you're just it's against your wishes versus yeah we, we kind of tried a little bit but it doesn't bother us and we're just going to like you know try this alternative so that I, I think you're right it's interesting to see where where this line is drawn between you know did they want this to happen expect it or was it you know was it something I, that just kind of came out of left field 
I don't think you make 31 offers, entertain, what was it, 11, 12 visits, official visits on, on, and again, sweet spot kids, Mike. These yeah. these were high level, you know, top 80 players. Yeah. You don't invest that much time, financial resources, energy, um, even the, the the players' time as well, kind of back and forth because they're in the they're in the process too. Yeah. Without expecting better than at this point now zero, zero. out of that yeah. group. Exactly. And you're saying we got to go to the portal and we got to go yeah. find this and we're gonna. And again, admir- admirable. It's admirable that you're looking at an NIL commitment. I'm I'm all for this. Yeah. But it's not the end all be all, and I yeah. I'm hesitant to buy into the idea that you can go to the portal with a with a with with a box of cash with a large payroll yeah. only because it's so rare in sports i mean it's 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 a unicorn yeah. to where you're able to do that yeah. and and i mean i and that's on the professional levels we've not really seen this approach at the collegiate level at least legally yeah. um where you're going to come in with this with this large, you know, with this idea of we're going to, you know, we're going to take everything off the table that could get a kid to go elsewhere except for yes, who we are. Yeah. We are who we are. We do yeah. what we do. It, it, we are we are this group that we we are who we are. Yeah. And and that's the thing of does that really Yeah, does it work that way? And we're not sure yeah. We have our suspicions. Yeah. That's like my <laughs> and yeah, tell you. Yeah. And you know where our suspicions probably are just hearing us. It's like, um Yeah. And I'm yeah. looking at the teams that are that are that are progressing in the tournament with bases, you know. Yeah. Houston has a base of, of high school players that have stuck around two, three years. Yeah. UConn has that. I mean, yeah. you fill in. I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm yeah. not saying that it shouldn't be tried. Yeah. It's just a question of again. I think you bring up a quick question: the strategy or circumstance, yeah. and we're going to know kind of going in. This summer is going to be very telling as to is IU going to keep recruiting certain top eighty players in state or in the area? Yeah. Are we yeah, going to what are we going to see out of this necessarily? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you're right. It's um, and I do agree with you that yeah, with the number of. Uh, offers that were made. And I, I think I posted on Twitter, like sometime in the summer, like that I use official visit rate this year was the highest they've had in a long time. I and mean, they had 11 mm-hmm. of top 80 kids. Uh, they've been averaging about two or three uh, top 80 visits uh, per cycle over the last like, you know, eight to 10 years. So this is way above uh, by like a multiple of three where they've been in terms of that rate. So I agree. I, I don't think it's a complete surprise. I, I would say that they w- they had expectations of getting some kids out of there. Mm-hmm. I've just, I, I did notice how interesting it was that sometimes some of the offers seem almost like audition invites. It's like, yeah. okay, we're, we're offering you. Okay, now let's talk about, you know, let's look at your skill sets. And then there almost be some sort of like front burner, back burner actions that would happen with the recruits, which happens, you know, some teams do yeah. that. It's just, but I, I was interested in seeing how there were definitely some recruitments, I would say, that were not so much whiffs and looked a little bit more like, hmm, well, they just kind of prioritize some kids over the others. And, um, yeah, go you took a, a few called balls, a, a few third strike, called third strikes. Let's call yeah. them that. You know, maybe just yeah. call them like, you know, blow by. Yeah, or... that, yeah that's, that's good. Yeah. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I've had these conversations on social media. You know, I've had different people kind of like, you know, ask me like, oh, well, what do you think is going to happen with the portal? You know, and I, I do think that when you're trying to fill 100% of a recruiting class in a window that, that constitutes 12% of the calendar year, that's a very challenging reality, even within the speed dating um, circumstances of the portal. Well, it's just a lot of people in a very short period of time. It takes a lot of coordination. And yeah, you're going to have to hit on some kids. And I've also talked about this under the circumstances that are not ideal because most of the top portal kids uh, in the last class, about 85% of them went to tournament teams. 
And so if you're not a tournament team and you have some of these other sort of headwinds that are going against you that we've talked about in the chip stack thing, when your chip stacks are going down as a coach, recruiting gets more difficult. It doesn't become impossible. It just it narrows the pool of players that are typically available to you. So the question is, how much is money going to fill that gap? Can money really by itself just completely hurdle all those other considerations that have caused so much problem for coaches in the same circumstances, you know, that we've seen in history. So yeah, I, I have my suspicions that it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult than some people, oh. people expect, but I also don't think that it means that India is not going to have any access at all to some no. decent players. I think there's a good chance that there could be some surprises that, you know, that are going to yeah. hit that could possibly really like change the dynamics of what people expect. Well, and you, I want to correct you on one thing. You said one class, you're not replacing one class. You have, Two yeah. fifth-year seniors. Yeah. You have uh, – Kalel Ware is left. Uh, Malik Renew is ascending to be a junior. So you basically have one junior. You have two freshmen who are now sophomores in Newton and Cups. Not really sure about Newton's. Um, yeah. And then Renew, who we're not really sure, he's too ascending to a sophomore. Not really sure. Does he announce – I don't think he's announced yet at this at, at, yeah. our, at our recording yeah. what his intentions are. But you're now talking about filling – your next year's next year's sophomores, next year's juniors, next yeah. year's seniors, you're gonna to need to fill in multiple spots. Yeah. Exactly. And that's you're you're talking about a multi tier and an approach in that route. Yeah, that's so. what that's what we talked about in A C radio we we're talking with Coach Tonsoni is that uh, you because you've had these gaps, you have no junior class like right now, um, you're gonna to have to probably like stagger some of these portal kids that will essentially replicate the uh, development curve of having like actual high school kids come through. You might have to take some kids that are basically sophomores and juniors to replace the sophomores and juniors you didn't get in the high school um, pool. So, so yeah, it's going to be challenging and I'm going, it's going to be uh, interesting to see the next few weeks, how this unfolds. And like I said, you and I will have this conversation uh, <laughs> down the road. <laughs> As we do, as yeah. we do, and we will share it, and we will share it with you all as well. Yeah. Um, anything you want to talk about wrapping up? I mean, I know that you and I both, yeah, have an interesting perspective on some things. Oh yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, so, I the the true fan comment. I know that was an interesting one. Obviously, um, yeah. I, I don't want to get into the moral arguments on the whole no. true fan debate related to what Co Coach Woodson said at the, that senior day speech, because that editorial has been written like a hundred times by a hundred different commentators already. So that's, I don't think we're going to add anything to the oeuvre of the, uh, of that no. conversation. Uh, one thing I think we can say confidently as just a pure matter of strategy as, you know, kind of in the X's and Joe's, um, uh, world that we occupy. Um, I would say confidently, and I think you might agree, there's probably no mentally stable political consultant or PR strategist that would have signed off on that speech that uh, Coach Woodson gave on senior night. Nope. If, um, yeah, if anything, like that's a speech that that's written by a consultant whose candidates stopped paying their consultancy fee like months ago and they're just looking for the quickest way to like permanently deep six the campaign <laughs> it's like yeah hmm, what can i do like how could i get his constituents constituency divided as quickly as possible like oh i know let's let's divide him into factions it'll further drive down the poll numbers <laughs> I, yeah, that, that that's uh, a, yeah, it's, it's definitely some uh, almost Nixonian uh, <laughs> angle yeah. there. We, we we put a plant on the we we put a plant on the on the on the, on the Mo Udall campaign. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> just to just to blow this up, uh, yeah. just light the stick of dynamite. Watch all the bodies floral. Yeah. The, the Don, I, Donald the Donald Segretti of the, uh, the Donald Segretti of, of basketball, <laughs> basketball media <laughs> basketball fan and media relations. And I get it. I and I mean. Hell, you coach a bunch of twelve-year-olds. You're emotional about a lot of things, and mm. I, there are, and I get it. Um, that being said, um, I think at the end of the day, it's it's a thing where anymore everyone's on the hot seat. You know, yeah. you hop into the trilly, and and the hot seat is it's a hot take type of thing. You know, are you on the hot seat or you're not on the hot seat? Yeah. I mean, 
it's almost an academic thing where these are these are highly compensated, highly sought after jobs in a highly competitive environment with a very low, and we've talked about this and we will continue to talk about it, where you have a profession where you you have 80% turnover in 10 years. That's at jobs that are paying incredibly well. That's telling you that stability is always, it's always a question mark. Um, I do think at the end of the day, it's not about a bad season. It's not about, it's about, I think for a lot of, I think for you and me, especially, it's more like, okay, let's look at where things are. Let's give our honest assessment yeah. and we'll see where things are as it progresses. It's not about anything other than just fans who happen to listen to us understanding that maybe that's where we're, where we're coming from yeah. at the same time as a former student, buddy president, as a guy that also was a for was a student leader um done alumni stuff too um i always like iu you know we we, we we've always fought we've always we've always argued with each other we've always just vociferously debated discussed back and forth it's 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 a disgustingly sick soap opera at times mm -hmm. and, it, and we're, it doesn't matter it, it we do this over parking kids just remember we do this over parking yeah we we mike and i could spend three hours debating parking on campus we yeah. i know it because we We've did it. it exactly and it's okay for us to have some dissent it's okay for us to have some conversations we all love you know the best art. You know any couple that's art that agrees on everything is a couple yeah. is not going to last not very last. long. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, to remember, even within a fan base, there's always you know there's just different types. You know. And sometimes you got crazy call Uncle Eddie that's running around. You never know what he's going to do. And yeah. sometimes he's going to tweet at a recruit, and you're saying, "Put the yeah. phone down. Put the bottle of bourbon down, and the phone both, Uncle exactly. we, Uncle Eddie. We're done." And, so. and it only happened again when things when you win. These, these differences don't really uh, materialize. When, he, when, when you when win, losing. When you win, he's eccentric. Problem. When yes, you're exactly. losing, he's institutionalized. He's yeah, exactly. He's he's gone. <laughs> so, that being said, uh, we're gonna wrap up this episode of X's and Joes, and uh, just want to say a special thanks to Bob Thompson for the music you hear on the show, as well as John Ringer of RingDesign.com for designing the logo that you see. And um, Mike, appreciate once again spending some time with you. Absolutely, Bob. No, it was, it was fun as always. I'm glad we both had good resting vacations. And um, yeah, looking Rest. forward to uh, Sweet 16 and, and forward. Yeah, uh, so for Looking Ahead, uh, Episode 8, uh, Bob and I will host an AMA. Um, a M? 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 I oh, yes. A A. Uh, a a U A U A A U A. Because I'll answer questions too. Exactly. Or I'll just no, sit or here. Or They'll have questions. I was just going to sit here and like with with a drink and just like let you you know handle it. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, at this point, we could just sit there. It's like question one. So tell us about you know. T t no. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No. We'll, yeah. No. Moving on. Ask question us. Two. Exactly. Just ask us. Yeah. But yeah. ask us if yeah. Yeah, so Sorry. this is so it will be an uh, an ask ask us anything episode. We'll call it a you take the wheel, ask us anything, and we do mean anything. Like we will obviously focus on basketball, but if you have questions about things not related to basketball, about you know some of our other passions, whether it's movies, politics, history, or uh, just uh, Bob and me, you know at IU, um, yeah, you can you can throw <laughs> this in there, and we'll 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 choose whether. They are appropriate to answer or not, or if we think we could give, uh, you know, a, uh, a a a reasonably passable um, answer that would not give us some trouble with the sponsors. Do, do I need so, legal counsel for this? Because exactly. some of our friends might actually, they know enough about us that they might try to get us in a position where I might I, have to plead a Fifth I, Amendment. I fully expect that's why we're going to filter these, uh, you know, these questions. I, uh, yeah, we're going to re we're going to. Post out on, uh, let's see, the AC uh, assembly call sub stack. Uh, we'll probably put something out on the Twitters as well. And uh, just remind you to, to uh, subscribe to uh, the assembly call sub stacks and get access to all the cool stuff they have within the network. But um, yeah, that will be coming probably in two weeks. And so we'll do that. And then we'll hopefully quickly after that, we'll have a portal discussion uh, once the once we get into April after the national championship game. So, so yeah, I, this is great because it's the end of the season. So we can, 
you know, Bob and I can do some crazy Ivans right into some of our, our weird uh, non-basketball interests. And I think, uh, yeah, I think this summer we could have some fun conversations around that. Hold on, I'm coming. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. So this endless conversation was brought to you by the Back Home Network. Be sure to check out all the great BA Back Home Network content, including the Assembly Call, Doing the Work, and Crimson Cast on YouTube and backhomenetwork.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Weemuth. And I'm Bob Motes. Take care, everybody. Have a great have a great week. Bye.